And here we go again. Welcome to Redneck TV with Kat. And Scott. <laughs> we're and doing Scott. something a little different this time, <clears throat> we're as you both, may have noticed. We're both on that camera. We're both so, there, too. Yeah, so with uh, Scott and Kat. I'm doing this in reverse with Kat and Scott. But that's, in, that's impolite to start with myself. So with Scott and Kat. Episode 44, anyways. So we're we're having a um, first of its kind kind of redneck TV episode, I guess. I would say so. Yeah. And um, today we're going to be responding to a comment that I don't even know if that's my subscriber. I don't think it's a subscriber at all. I think it's just someone who randomly left, or maybe no, I don't know. Well, he said he kind of found your channel. Um... Kind of found back channel. just stumbled across your channel. Actually. Yeah. So he's not a subscriber. Yeah. So this person left a comment on my previous Cat Talk episode um, entitled um, About the Fifth Column, where I was expanding on the dangers uh, that of um, what happens when a state like the Russian state currently um, alienates its fifth column. And by fifth column, apparently, I mean uh, the so-called intelligentsia, the people who are Normally, you know, creatives, scientists, you know, uh, writers, etc., etc., people who are very prone to all sorts of rather liberal um, opinions. And what happens when a mostly conservative state or establishment alienates this fifth column? And this fifth column is being exploited by various outside forces who seek to topple the existing regime in Russia, and it doesn't, you know, we're not talking about, like, is uh, the existing um, order of things in Russia a good thing, or it's a bad thing, whatever, you, regardless of that, the weaponization, the process of alienation of the fifth column, and then the uh, potential danger of an outside power, whoever that is, right, weaponizing this fifth column and turning it against uh, the host state. So I was talking on this episode about that knowing that the red wave is coming here in America, I was kind of expressing my um, worries about that if the Republicans, right, if the conservatives in this country, they start pushing it a little too far, uh, and if instead of building bridges with the other side, they start alienating all of these people, albeit they are pretty radicalized right now, however. Right, right. If they completely alienate them and this divide persists in our society, they might become the new fifth column, which is going to be hurting us, is going to be like a uh, thorn in our side for years to come. So I was kind of pointing out towards Russia and saying, look, this is what Russia currently is doing, and it's evident right now with mobilization and that kind of stuff and the sentiment among younger people, you know, liberal-leaning people. Uh, and I was saying, look at that, we shouldn't do it here. That's a problem. Right. Sure. Um, so, and there came along someone called Balauri's Buratori. I don't know how to read his name. I'm assuming it's a he. And he left me a comment, a lengthy one, should I say, to which I responded, and I've just filmed a cat talk episode 269 in which I've covered his initial comment and my following comment, uh, but there was yet another comment that he left and that I was not in time to cover. So I thought that it might be an interesting idea to actually uh, talk about this and explore these topics here on Redneck TV this time. Why not? It's a follow-up. Um continuation of a thought yeah a thought an actual thought not a t-h-o-t not a thought not another thought <laughs> yeah <laughs> <clears throat> so um i've covered on my cat talk you know his initial comment and uh my response so far what is your impression from what you've read well there's a lot here to digest actually um 
he goes into matters of um, world banking and things like that that I have very little knowledge about. Um, I can't assess that section of his comment very well. Um, I, I think what, what kind of uh, jumped right at me from that section about the banking system is that it, it appears that he sees it as something reliable. Whereas yeah. the difference is that I don't see it as reliable at all. In fact, I believe that the current monetary um, financial system that exists in the world, or rather systems, and if we're talking specifically about the Western uh, banking system, that is going to collapse. And he makes it sound like a future event that's going to happen sometime if the U.S. continues this kind of path that they're on now on I see it, that this is happening now, currently. Yes. I, I see it exactly that way, because yeah. he, he is, you know, talking about the Federal Reserve. Uh, somewhere here in the comment, he says, um, it's an exceptionally bad move. Okay. Ignoring the effect of a country basically paving the way towards CCP century. Uh, go through a U.S. bank. Okay, this is incredibly powerful. Borderline and cheat code. The Fed has a paper called The International Role of the U.S. Dollar. I am worried about, well, worried about, you know, the resilience of the Fed because, um, do you remember we've, we've seen this stat somewhere uh, that the, um, the amount of printed money was in the billions just in the past two or three years, yes. whereas the yes. increase, uh, previously there was an increase only nine, for nine billion dollars and that was across decades or something along those lines. So we clearly can see an escalation um, and uh, clearly the, um, the Fed is exploiting the printing machine a little too much, uh, which is a major understatement. But um, I'm, you know, me myself not being a financial expert, I can clearly see that there are enormous problems and a lot of these problems were uh, set as you know, they were kind of ingrained in the, by, they were by design. Because the Fed took over the financial system of the United States back in 1933, as far as I remember. If anybody thinks I'm wrong, fact check me on that one. In 1972, right, uh, the US dollars have been decoupled from the gold standard, sure. which uh, dealt another major blow to this currency. And ever since then, in fact, we're dealing with the petrodollar. Um, now, as of right now, I find it rather questionable what constitutes the value of the U.S. dollar. Is it in the power of our military uh, stationed outside of our country? Is it in the military-industrial complex? Is it in the petrodollar? Is it in the amount of oil that we possess? Uh, in what assets? Where is this value? He uh, makes the point here that basically every U.S. president since Reagan has abused this dominant position to print almost consequence free money. And as such, you have it that for every dollar in the U.S. economy, there's more than two dollars in a treasury outside the U.S. Um, they won't sell all their dollars, but they'll sell a significant amount of it, more than enough to drastically lower the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, this is, it's not a future event, you yeah, know. It's, um, it's happening. Would, yeah. I think it's happening right yeah. now. I mean, when did yeah. Putin actually, uh, Russia possesses, as far as I remember, 21 or 26% of the uh, reserves of gold in the world. Russia possesses 21 or to 26% of these gold reserves. So Putin uh, switched back uh, to the model, um, Basically, the Russian ruble now is supported by golden standard. He went back to that. Uh, which in itself uh, already, I think, poses a threat to the U.S. dollar. Sure. Especially in light of the current events and the NATO-Russia war unfolding on the territory of Ukraine as we speak. And Putin demanding payment for Russian resources in rubles. Yes. Yes, and at the same time, Russia integrating its ruble into various payment systems, Asian payment systems. Uh, so, I am not really sure, as I said, I don't see the U.S. dollar as a reliable currency as of now. It appears to me that, generally speaking, the world is um, 
going through a very turbulent time. Um, and, you know, it kind of, you could say, well, it depends on which side of things are you, but I think regardless of what side people are on, changes are underway. And it's not like they're coming a decade from now, they're already underway. Yeah, this last sentence in his comment says, long story short, this would be the worst economic crisis the U.S. has ever seen by a large margin. Um, I'm not sure that we're not at that crisis point already currently. We are, and the way I see it is that we're actually spiraling further down. And what, um, you know, it's like you can't allege something uh, when you don't have hard facts of like, well, this happens because, and here is hard evidence. Right. But yeah. uh, when you look at certain events, as we see right now with this economic downward spiral, uh, and you look at the actions of our current political ruling class, at the very least, it raises questions. Why are these people exacerbating the existing problems instead of solving them? Yeah. What is their game? Good point. Yeah. So you could, you, could, you could think, okay, there might be options. Number one, maybe this currently existing monetary financial system is unsustainable and it kind of outlived its purpose and now something else has to come and this is just part of a natural trajectory. Okay, that could be one theory. Another theory is that there is nothing to salvage, there is no plan and the elites and the, whoever the powers that be, they just pocket whatever they can right now uh, and they're trying to capitalize on, um, they're trying to rather use this shift to a new era, a new monetary era, to their advantage and transfer their wealth from the old fiat currency stuff, right, into something like, I don't know, cryptocurrency, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Transfer of assets. Explanation, kind of, yeah. On the other hand, I think, and that I think is in plain sight, um, the world as a whole is undergoing some sort of transition because it appears to me that the equation that was set in place um, after the end of the Second World War, the kind of agreement that was set between the hemispheres, you know, what Asia is up to, what Russia, that whole Cold War uh, uh, equation is now being, is now shifting and it's kind of um, not immediately obvious who is going to dictate what. Is it is it the West who's going to be um, showing you know uh, showing the way, leading the way, or is it going to be Asia? Too early to tell. <laughs> it's too early to tell. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. But also, as of now, in the context of the NATO-Russia war, I keep calling it deliberately that, the NATO-Russia war. It is. Um, it makes me really wonder because European countries don't seem to be doing very well. Not at all. Is it going to lead to some kind of further amalgamation of power within the United States through economic dominance? On the European continent? Maybe. Because we've talked about this just what? It's quite possible. Yeah. Quite possible, right? And it's not just about military might, it's about, you know, energy, it's about resources. Uh, it's also about businesses uh, that now, my understanding is that it's going to be easier for European businesses and companies to uh, relocate their enterprises into the United States. It's going to be more lucrative, right? Yeah. Um, so it looks like this might be the case to me. What is that going to do to the monetary system? What are we going to be looking at here? I don't know. Uh, what's the role of Britain, for example, in that the UK? Um, what k kind of chunk of what are they going to get out of this equation? I don't know. Um, and more than that, I think that uh, this, this process is going to happen anyways, regardless of who wins this uh, war on the territory of Ukraine. Right. This is a process that it's kind of one of, one of those things, you know, it's going to rain anyways, right? It's just a question of is it going to rain, is it going to be a thunderstorm or is it going to just, you know, kind of drip and drip and drip and this kind of thing. But it's, it's going to happen anyways. So the question is who's going to collect more water out of this? Yeah. But as I'm looking at this comment, I... 
I quite frankly I didn't quite get it what he was getting at here me either. in his um, initial assessment the other thing that really pokes out about his initial comment is his comment uh, here one side taking power and oppressing the other you seem to be especially worried about a left takeover in the US again like, like this hasn't happened yet it's my opinion that it has happened already and it's been happening for almost two years now there's a tiny minority of deluded extreme leftists, while the vast majority are varying shades of right. This is not correct. Yeah, this is just not correct. That's not an accurate assessment. I've made a case on the, this cat talk that I was just filming. Mm -hmm. I made the case that, first of all, you know, it's kind of, it's not a universal lens to see um, things through. I mean, the right, left dichotomy yeah. because I pointed out towards that if you look at a given individual you know your average person throughout their lifetime you see a tendency in younger people who are like teenagers and in their 20s they naturally tend to lean rather leftwards Absolutely. they're unsettled yep. their values are not established they are more, more prone to outrage and stuff like this emotional decision-making uh, activism raging, as well activism, raging sure. hormones, all sorts of stuff right. which leads them to be more kind of, which is natural because a younger person is supposed to be open minded supposed to absorb a lot of stuff uh, but then with age as the person matures you start to see more of a conservative or kind of what we call in political terms more of a conservative right wing right. settled mindset where right. people start to think about well how about you know having a family maybe or how about having children or how am I going to pay my bills and what am I supposed to do with my life and oh by the way I'm kind of like you know 50 already or 60 and it's rather a what I think is a rather pathological tendency when, when you see people who are like 60 and they're still as airheaded as if they're like uh, 17 years old and uh, espousing the same kind of values and same kind of mindset it's just not um, it's just not okay, something's wrong, you know? So this statement about that, um, he's expressing his concerns about uh, all of this, various shades of right wing, whatever. I'm trying to, what do you think is the age of this person? Just from the, his comments, I say he's got to be in his 50s. Okay. Um, because he talked about the war mm -hmm. um, and his his mother um, lived through the war so that mm -hmm. would put him born in the baby boomer age say in the 60s yeah. somewhere maybe around 1970 at the latest I would say okay maybe even 55-ish uh, maybe don't know, just from reading the comment. Yeah, I'm kind of divided on this one because I am trying to figure out what are his like views for society and for how things are supposed to be because that usually is an indication of, you know, the maturity of the person, you know. More government, less government. Actually, I misspoke in reading that again. It was his maternal grandmother would tell him about the war. So I uh, probably overestimated his age by 10 years at least. Okay, so you think uh, he's like what? The 40s. Millennium? Millennium? Yeah. Might be. Possibly. Might be, yeah. Um, probably. I'm just sensing that... I don't know. I think he has some sort of... I don't want to be judgmental, but I, I'm under the impression that he does have some obvious biases. And... Sure. Um, that he's kind of biased against uh, anything right-wing because he's like, well, why would you be worried about, you know, the left taking over in the U.S.? And have you been not paying attention? <laughs> Where you've been for two years, bud? <laughs> no, apparently, and that, that we know from the next comment, we know that he is probably... Oh, no, it's from this one. He's just listened to Greg Locke, Victory Network, etc. You've looked, you've looked up this guy and it hey, turned I've out he's... I've never heard of Greg Locke. Um... Neither did I. Maybe some of our 
viewers know who Greg Locke is? I, I didn't know who Greg Locke is. Yeah, I didn't know. Um, never heard of him. Greg Locke is an American Baptist pastor. Um, I'm looking this up on Wikipedia, so take the term conspiracy theorist lightly. Because yeah. we know we know from past experience Wikipedia leans heavily left. Yes. And people that espouse conspiracy theories um, are often proven right three weeks down the road. Uh, <laughs> just saying. Yes. Um, founder of Global Vision Bible Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. So he's mm-hmm. a pastor from Tennessee, which, I mean, we can relate to that. We're in, I don't know much about Mount Juliet, but I'm guessing that's a rural town in yeah. Tennessee, one state over from us. Yes. We live in rural Kentucky. It's the same kind of set limits, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, Mr. Locke first rose to prominence for his support for Donald Trump. Okay, so I can relate to that, too. Yeah, I can relate to that, as too. As well as his opposition to COVID-19 measures. All right. Yeah. I can relate to that too. Why? Sure. Nothing extremist there because the uh, COVID-19 measures were pretty draconian and tyrannical. It says here he had a you know rough childhood. Uh, apparently he didn't get along with his stepfather. Uh, got arrested a few times. Uh, his mother remarried when he was five. Locke had a turbulent relationship with his stepfather. Following multiple arrests, he was sent to a children's home at the age of 15 where he converted to Christianity. Well, that's not that unusual. Yeah. Um, founded a Baptist church here, Global Vision Baptist Church, in 2006. The church officially split from the Independent Baptist Movement and changed its name to Global Vision Baptist Church, or Bible Church, in 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, he first drew national attention in 2016 for a Facebook video posted in which he criticized changes to Target's bathroom policy. I have to look that up. Well, the bathroom issue, I guess, is... Big issue for some yeah, people. Yeah, this is an LGBT issue. So uh, yeah, so all of a sudden, conservative from Tennessee is going to have problems with transgender bathrooms or whatever. That's not surprising either. Yeah, with various um, yeah. you know scare scarecrows going into uh, <laughs> female restrooms. You know, everybody in their right mind should have a problem with it. It's not okay. Yeah, you know, right. because I mean, that is actually the point of contention. What's, what's there to criticize this guy about so far? Huh? Yes, Trump supporter didn't like COVID. Doesn't like um, whatever targets bathroom policy. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. He was present during the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Right. Yeah, okay. So I'm guessing that this guy, uh, Balauri, yeah. I'm guessing he's, if not, if he doesn't declare that he's left-wing, he's left-leaning yeah. or very liberal, doesn't whatever. Like this guy because he's conservative and a Trump supporter and uh, kept his church open during COVID-19 outbreaks. Yeah, so he probably, in his mind, he is... Um, he sees, he views Donald Trump as a Nazi, just as portrayed by the mainstream media, the legacy sure. media. Yes, and um, doesn't understand, neither does understand American politics and American um, social landscape. And on top of that, has a very warped understanding of the word, uh, world processes because he views everything through the lens of uh, mainstream media. That's just my assessment, I guess. Um, this is a very short article uh, by Wikipedia standards. There's only half a page here. Um, I never heard of this guy. Had some kind of, well, this is a little extreme. Burned some witchcraft books uh, from Twilight and the Harry Potter series. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. That might be a little extreme. <laughs> might be. I mean, yeah. and I, I've been, I'm kind of talking about this occasionally. I'm pointing out towards that fringes on whichever side are dangerous and not helpful at all. Because I do think that, you know, um, you know, it kind of depends. You know, it's, it's so difficult to pinpoint who is what, who is actually fringe and who is not, because of how the media, the info space has been warped, especially in the past four years, because... Sure. Someone like Stefan Molyneux, 
uh, oh, yeah. is proclaimed a far right, a far right extremist, and whatever. Even though you know, to my knowledge, you know, and I've listened to plenty of his videos. You did too. Um, he's a very reasonable man. Yeah, he's kind of not easy to listen to. He's very critical, and some people might not like him, you know, and some people might get triggered. You know, I personally find it difficult to listen to him when he's talking about women. Sure. Biased. Okay. But um, he's portrayed by uh, the mainstream as a far-right extremist and whatnot. You know, Tim Pool all of a sudden, who is not, who is basically <laughs> centrist, and yeah, disaffected liberal by his own mission, is portrayed as some sort of right-wing, uh, I don't know, whatever. And that's not accurate as well, you know, so the, the whole... Dermar was explaining to you what an overtone window is, right? Yeah, yeah. This whole overtone window has shifted left significantly. So now all of a sudden, everybody who is kind of still in the center and wants to hold the center and wants to be there and kind of tries to retain some semblance of balance, right? It gets labeled right wing. Right wing, yeah, right wing, far right wing, whatever. Because and so, the left went way over to the left. Yes. The left went way over to the left, and uh, it's not just that this overtone window got shifted, you know, in some leftist circles or something like that. No, it's no. the entire political establishment moved leftwards uh, towards more tyranny, more government control, uh, a more socialistic approach Absolutely. to... Uh, things and uh, the the event that indicated immediately uh, made it apparent which way things went was exactly COVID. You know, it doesn't really matter if that's a uh, you know I'm not going to debate you know the uh, not going to talk about the details of this event, right? But regardless of what one th one thinks about this event, um, we could see. In this country and in other countries, we could see the extent to which the government of a given country would go to exploit this event to its advantage. In how many countries the government overstepped tremendously and just went full in with authoritarian measures under the premise and under the guise of taking care of its citizens. In how many countries this issue, uh, this problem uh, got totally mismanaged. Right? But anyways, we could see um, in a very short span of time uh, what politicians really aspire to what, what branches of government really want what, what, is, what, does, uh, what do the powers that be, what do they really have in mind for the people and how do they see the ultimate solutions. And then, of course, and this is not a conspiracy theory, we don't need to, you know, allude to <clears throat> any pastors or anything like that, all it takes is just uh, going to, a, uh, what's the name of their website, World Economic Forum. Yeah. All you need to do is go and read up on their programs, on their projections of how things should be in the world, in the modern world, whatever, and whatever explanations they give, you know, whatever justifications they give, be that future pandemics, or war, or famine, or water shortage, or whatever, they are, they have a blueprint, and they say it, they express it at their forums at Davos, right? Um, they express their sentiment and their understanding of where the world should go, and these are non-elected officials, but that's a rabbit hole of its own. My point is, is that this person, judging by what he's saying, he is kind of in line with this mainstream vision of things and he doesn't present an alternative right you know what i mean so i don't know maybe just uh, just someone who gets his news from cnn mostly from those content creators i don't know <laughs> um well this comment uh if anything, I'd say the biggest threat is the way many exceptionally popular evangelical leaders are rallying up their base towards political goals. Just listen to Greg Locke. And, I mean... <laughs> is he popular? The things he and others are saying are terrifying. Among really? other things, replacing laws with his interpretation of the Bible, cop, Sharia law. When you consider that they have had success in nominating people to government positions as well as growing influence among the Republican Party... I've never heard of this guy. All right. Uh, Neither did I. I don't see what political influence he could possibly have in the United States if you and I haven't heard of him. 
I, have, I don't know how this guy's hurt. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, seriously. I don't know. Yeah. It's probably, you know, look, here's what I think. I think that this guy heard of him because the leftists, they circulate the more right-wing, more oh, niche right. people. They're like, oh, look at that pastor over there. Yeah. What if these guys take over? And they point the finger at these smaller figures sure. who are like, you know, uh, I almost said church service members. And I'm like, no, that's not how you priests, uh, pastors, etc., etc., mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. Something that is more or less clear cut um, conservative. They use them as an example. That's how he knows about it. Because if he was kind of a middle of the way liberal or middle of the way kind of conservative, he probably wouldn't be swayed towards whichever extremes, and he wouldn't hear about those. It's like there's probably uh, some prominent in narrow circles, widely known in narrow circles, like they say, right? Leftists uh, <laughs> who have been active during, you know, the uh, riots in Portland or the BLM stuff, who know each other, who know their, you know, names, yeah. etc. And their right-wing counterparts. I don't know these people. But this guy probably supports mega Republicans. Yeah, and mega Republicans. Know how evil they are. Yes, is a big scarecrow kind of a word, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but you know, he talks about this. But how about uh, leaders that are definitely very popular, like Donald Trump himself, or like uh, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis? Yes, Ron DeSantis. Are these people evangelicals? Not at all. Not at all. Actually, Donald Trump used to be a um, member of the Democrat Party, wasn't he? I believe so, at one point, yeah. Yeah. 2010-ish. Yep, yeah. pretty liberal, yeah. I would say, you know. Um, He's hardly a Republican now, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, how do you see this? Do you see this from the standpoint of a leftist who is concerned, uh, concerned with a far-right wing Christian takeover? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't exactly see how Donald Trump fits into that mold. He actually said, if anything, I'd say the biggest threat, so this is what he's calling the biggest threat, uh, is not, not the left taking over and the elites that uh, you mentioned earlier, yeah. as we see it, but yeah. the evangelical right-wing mega-Republicans oh, What's the, danger the biggest threat. And it sounds like Joe Biden talking, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and you've seen my response to his comment. Yeah. I was kind of generic. And I yeah. kept it tame. Yeah. But uh, I don't know exactly what's the problem with uh, conservatives taking over, even if they do take over. Ultimately, uh, conservatism, uh, conservatism is not a threat to um, the existence of humanity. Neither is religion. Actually, we have uh, an amendment that allows for freedom of religion in this country. Yes. Um, you know, so I would make the case that leftism is something ultimately destructive historically. If we put things in historic perspective, we see that everywhere where um, socialism or communism came to prominence, it always led to destruction. It always led to uh, bloodshed, to suffering and all sorts of things like that. Whereas. If you look at conservatism as uh, a way of preserving tradition, this kind of stuff, you can see that that cannot pose any existential threat to a given population, unless it is bastardized, of course, right? Because it focuses on the preservation of existing traditions and norms. Yes, you can bastardize this to an extent, and you can put a, an authoritarian spin on that, and then you get fascism, and then you get... If you put a left-wing spin on this, on traditionalism, you get uh, Nazi Germany. Yeah. Right? You get sure. this. You know what I'm talking about. So, um, if you put spins on these things, but uh, leftism in itself and conservatism are two very different things. And historically, it's just not... I mean, where do you see uh, leftism that actually succeeded? It didn't succeed in I, Russia. I can't find a place. Yeah. I can't find a place either. Yeah. It always, you know, look. It always it, ends up defeating itself. Yes. It's a self-defeating thing. It makes people, you know, in my mind, what I'm also thinking about is that the very concept of people relying uh, wholly, solely, or to a significant large extent on the central government is an extreme, it makes the country the given 
a given population extremely vulnerable because it makes people dependent on them. Yeah. And then as we can right. see in, in modern history, what it does also is that these, these countries start flocking together and they're very prone to outside influence. And then uh, toppling the existing government, replacing it with a puppet government, stuff like this becomes very easy, not to mention, and that was my argument when I was talking about the USSR and uh, Russia with this vertical of power. Russia is very prone to leftist takeovers, I think, in the future, potentially, because of its vertical of power. Mm. The situation in Nazi Germany, why did Nazi Germany happen? Uh, it, uh, what preceded it? The Weimar Republic, right? which kind of looks very much like our country right now. Uh, the circumstances, um, the conditions for an, an authoritarian, tyrannical takeover were set in place. That is ultimately the danger of it. So I think this person doesn't make any of these arguments. I'll have to agree with you. Um... He doesn't, he doesn't, his why? arguments are based in bias. Yeah, I mean, he's just basically just saying that he's concerned, he would be concerned with a right-wing takeover, but he doesn't explain what's the danger of that takeover. I can explain, as I've just explained, what are the dangers of the left-wing takeover. We're seeing them now, right in now. real time. Yes. Uh, I don't think we need to list, or maybe we can, as usual, put up maybe a little list of how much, uh, how many lives, human lives, and how much suffering did it cost when communist regimes were taking over countries. Mm. You know, North Korea, China. And we've shown that before. Cambodia. I have, I have that on file somewhere. We can, yeah. We can dig that back up. Sure. That's the real cost yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, and even pre-communist era, right? Pre-modern era, if we look back in time, if we look back at the times of monarchies, right? Some of these monarchies were very tyrannical. Absolutely. So a modern, modern leftist structure reminds me a lot of uh, a monarchy structure in a sense. Structurally, not ideologically, because leftism ideologically is a whole different thing. It's uh, secular, it has nothing to do with religion, it's a religion of its own. Basically, you know, people who worship Karl Marx and uh, Friedrich Engels are lunatics, basically, I think. Uh, it was different in the times of monarchies, uh, because it, these were traditionalist societies, but the structure of these societies had that vertical of power, which still exists in Russia, right? This tsar or king or prince um, on the top and everything goes down like this. Right. So the will of the people is not in the equation. Yep. It's not there at all. Yep. So maybe, I, maybe it's my own bias, you know, uh, getting to the forefront here because I am a convict... A, a, con what is the word? Convinced? Convicted? Not convicted. Convinced. <laughs> You haven't even been tried yet. I a don't know staunch, how you should be convicted. I am a staunch <laughs> populist. Yes. I'm a staunch populist. Yes. And that's what, um, of all things, uh, in the first place, appeals to me uh, as the founding principle of this country is that the government should be by the people for the people. That's the idea that I love a lot. And that's what I want to see more of this. And uh, perhaps I'm kind of projecting my vision or my desires onto the rest of the world, but I do believe that ultimately this is a wonderful solution for many other countries. And that doesn't mean that I think that we should impose our American will on other countries, no. But to be the example of how we can make this work, that would be awesome because that would show an exam, make an example for other countries, for other people to look at us and be like, well, we can do it too in our culture. We need to get back to the basis that our founding fathers laid down for us. Yes. There, we have a constitution that, if followed, yes. sets up some good conservative values mm -hmm. that would rebuild our country. But also, by the way, allows for liberalism. Absolutely. Sure. It's not like it's um, some kind of... It, we don't have a constitution that, that constitutes monarchy. Right. Or tyranny. No. No, actually, the opposite. It constitutes balance. Yes. 
balance yeah. and that's the ultimate answer and this person further on well i responded in my comment then he went you know came back with another response and yeah. i was let's get to that sure yeah let's get to it uh i wasn't in time to cover this comment on my cat talk so um okay so he goes here about the accent um so he basically he uh says he come comes out as romanian here yeah. Uh, grew up, he says, and also grew up in the last days of the People's Republic and crazy days that followed. We had a very similar experience with a politician class, political class, that stemmed from our version of the KGB and some and sometimes even with the same characters. M Mitchell or Mechel assassinated our steel industry, for example. Know, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know who is, is, who is Mechel or Mechel. Much like Russia with... Uh, we've yet to recover from that dark period, and we probably won't. I'll take generations, it will take gen generations to change people's mentalities. And now he, he goes on to talk about who is the enemy. So, he says that's a very interesting question about who the enemy or enemies are. And I think that depends a lot on how you look at things. I'll use Russia as an example because it's something you know the context of, and not as a personal thing. Mm. Can, I, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. I just looked up this uh, Mitchell here. It's okay. Not, it's not a person at all. It's a company. Oh, it's a company. Mitchell is one of Russia's mining and metal companies comprising producers of coal, iron ore, and concentrated steel, rolled steel products headquartered in Moscow. It sells its products in Russia and overseas and is formerly known as public joint stock company Mitchell. Oh, so what did he say about it. taking over the steel industry or assassinate their steel industry, for example? All right, well, oh. that's, so what the competition? This is free market competition. On one hand, this is competition. On the other hand, yeah. um, I'm curious why does this person not ask any questions? Um, not ask his politicians, the politicians in his country, any questions. Yep. Right. Who did this? If you don't like this, who was in charge of your country who allowed this to happen? Right. Who told them to buy steel from Russia? Yes. Uh, or maybe, <laughs> or maybe it wasn't a bad idea, and maybe uh, your country is trading something back, you know, to Russia. What, what, what is there in that deal? You know. So the point that I was making is about that. You know, what I wanted to say is that. Um, he points out towards this, um, sometimes even the same characters, Mitchell, Assassinator, or Steel Industry, for example. Okay, but he doesn't provide any further context on uh, the involvement of the politicians from his own country, from his own ruling class in his country. How are they? Because it's not just probably Mitchell who uh, walked in, you know, uh, into uh, Romania and demanded that from now on, you're going to do this. You're going to buy our steel. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, probably not. Probably someone within the Romanian government, or some politicians, some business people, whatever, someone made this decision. So the question, the first question would be to these people, like, why are you uh, breaking deals like that with Russia, which don't serve our uh, national interest, for example, right? That would be the first, like here in this country, in America, right? China. Yeah, we have the first question is not even to China, to CCP. Like, duh, Captain Obvious, of course they have their own interest. They like to make money. They like to make money. That's clear and understandable. The first question is to our politicians, to our political elite, to people like Mitch McConnell in this, country, in this state, in yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. What the hell, Mitch, what happened? How is it so that the manufacturing from our state went overseas? Right. Explain. Right. I'd like to know who got all the money, who got all the benefits. And it's not just about, I would like to see more money. No. Why our own politicians, our own uh, elites are acting in a way that leads to the detriment of our own country. So the question is to these people. With China, it's understandable. It doesn't matter if it's CCP over there. Or if it's, uh, I don't know, a republic of China, or it's whatever form of government. They have their national interest, and they are doing that. So I wouldn't use this as an argument about that Russia, the Russian company, assassinated steel industry. And yeah. where are the questions to your 
political class. So, okay, then he goes on, and no, do you have anything to add on top of this? Nope, keep going. Uh, take generations to change people's mentalities. Um, but that's, that's an important point, too. Yeah. It will take generations to change people's mentalities. Yeah. I would think that, um, you know, given that, yes, sure, uh, 90s, the dissolution of the USSR, uh, the, um, the countries that used to be in the Warsaw Pact, they all uh, carried the scars of uh, both of the Soviet rule and of the post-Soviet period and the, tur you know, the turbulence of that period. Sure, but what is a healthy way to change people's mentalities? people's mentalities towards what what is the ultimate solution you know I would argue and it's not because I ultimately know all the answers but apparently my opinion which I believe is pretty pretty formed at this point I would argue that individual countries should work within themselves and um, get rid of uh, elites who do not work in the interests of these countries, you know? As a, as a person who is obviously populist, right, I would argue that, well, people should take matters in their own hands, that yes, I'm all for free market economy and all that kind of stuff, right? But maybe then things will change because maybe then, you know, trade agreements, uh, local geopolitics will start to change. So, I have, you know, again, that's my opinion, but I have some vision. It's, you know, it's debatable. People might say, no, that's, that's not going to work. Whatever. But I have an opinion. This person, where's your opinion? What is your solution? I just looked it up. Um, Romania is a <clears throat> member of the European Union. Okay. And um, this is an alliance that is not beneficial to any individual country within the European Union. Interesting, right? No, no. I remember back in 2015 when I'd been to France, I'd been talking to regular French people, my friends, mm -hmm. right? I was living with them. And I never heard anything good about the European Union from the French. I'm still not hearing anything good about the European yes. Union, especially in light of the um, NATO war with Ukraine. Yes. Yeah. With Russia. Well, excuse me, the NATO war in Ukraine. Uh, in I Ukraine, meant, you said, okay, yeah. Say, yeah. Excuse me. Yes, yeah. so, um, again, um, I don't see an indication here of any proposed solution. Right. You know, if there was a proposed solution, we could talk about, okay, I don't think this would work because, or I think this would rather work because. But when it's not there, just... Uh, pinning the, all the blame on, well, it's a Russian company that assassinated our oil oh, and steel industry. Uh, I mean, the, what kind of argument is it? Right. And what you were saying about individual countries need to strengthen themselves. Um, yeah. How can you do that when you're um, relying on the European Union, for example? You can't. Or, or NATO, for you example. You can't. Um, I think we should have probably learned the lesson about these kind of alliances from World War One and what happened back then. Yeah. Um, these are not good things. They take away the autonomy of each individual nation. Yes. And uh, more than that, it actually drags individual nations uh, into the kind of geopolitical turmoil and conflicts exactly. in which they, yeah. you know, they would have been better off not going into there. Look at the um, turbulence in Germany, France, Czech Republic right now towards mm -hmm. the NATO Russia war that's yeah. going on in Ukraine currently. Yeah. All right. How do any of those countries benefit from being part of those alliances right now? They don't. They don't. It's pretty arguable if, uh, I don't know, Czechia, for example, is uh, secure enough within NATO. It doesn't, it doesn't appear to be the case because, right. I mean, what we see de facto, we do see that Right, as of right now, European countries, right, or rather their leadership, they are solving their, you know, this country is asking for money, one of the Baltic states wants to get its money out of that fund, another country proposes that we need to use the money that was frozen up, the assets of Russian oligarchs, they're solving their, their kind of nitty-gritty whatever 
But that doesn't Pollock's believe... Pollock's looking for reparations for, <clears throat> from still Germany. from World War II. Yes. <laughs> from Germany. Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm waiting for the, uh, the Baltic states to claim reparations from Poland, for example. <laughs> Not that I'm anti-Polish, but I mean, how far can we go uh, in history with claims of, oh, I need reparations for that. Yeah. And I also need reparations for that. Okay. Uh, are all the European countries going to claim reparations from Italy for the Roman Empire, maybe? <laughs> Seriously. I think the Greeks still owe us something, don't they? Yeah. How about Austrians <laughs> asking for reparations from uh, modern Turkey? Because the Ottomans. <laughs> and but by the way, the Poles also asking for reparations from them. Yeah. yeah. Why not? The Greeks, by the way, legitimately could ask for reparations from Turkey because of the um, genocide of 1918. When the Turks were slaughtering ethnic Greeks, Christian Greeks, in Anatolia, which is that, that peninsula where Turkey is located, mm -hmm. right? The Armenians could probably go ahead and do something like that too and say, hey Turkey, how about you pay us mm, a little bit? Yeah. But will they do it? No, they won't. Why? Because Armenia, uh, on its own, is not even able to deal with Azerbaijan. Yeah. Like, they're no match against Turkey. So, Total capitulation. Yes. So, in order to make claims like that or even, you know, theoretically demand something from Turkey, Armenia will have to find allies. Which means what? Which means finding allies with a large regional power. Who is who? Russia. Right. Right. So, and this is where we are kind of swerving into the area of on one hand, there are alliances that are clearly dysfunctional. On the other hand, you can't, uh, you can't have countries uh, that are uh, entirely just left to, to their own means. Because forming alliances and some, some, uh, some unions or, hmm, I don't know what word to use, to you know, local geopolitical unions is inevitable. It's going to happen. Sure. The question is, uh, I think, is how functional are the current alliances? Are they actually functional? And I think that they're not. I Why? Agree. Because NATO has us in them. Um, what is our interest in Europe? Well, we kind of started there, right? When I said that we are going to be the beneficiaries of whatever. You know, European countries spiraling down the drain, right, economically and in terms of all of that stuff that's going on there. That's to our benefit. That's not to their benefit. We're the only beneficiaries. You have to kind of assess how much you deem our responsibility in the current NATO war in Ukraine. I estimate you it to, to be look pretty... At that pretty damn high. Right, so then what is our objective in that? Um, expanding our influence uh, in Europe, um, economically in terms of military presence potentially. Are we looking to get European businesses to move to the United States? Yes. Do you think that's really the goal? Yeah, I think mm. so. I think so because... Or that do we just want to sell them assets from the United States. I think, I think um, probably, I, you know, if it goes on down that path, I will not be surprised if uh, American corporations start to buy up European businesses and just buy up everything in Europe. And then, you know, like acquisition of this and acquisition of that, and then that firm and that firm and this company, whatever, are no longer European. They are a subsidiary of, I don't know, Walmart, yeah. <laughs> whatever, you right. know, Amazon, sure. you know, yeah. etc. So it's basically, um, I don't know, some form of uh, acquisition of property, I guess, mm -hmm. on our behalf. The Europeans are not benefiting from this. So yeah, it's like this NATO alliance... Uh, well, first of all, it wouldn't exist if we weren't in it, right? Right. Uh, and if we try to see things from, or so I think, if we try to see things from the standpoint of a given European country, like from the standpoint of France. If I was someone who genuinely cared for France, was a French person, a French, French patriot, I would be all for leaving NATO. Oh, yeah. To hell with NATO, get out of that, leave you the European Union, uh, have your own, on your terms, negotiate your own union or your own 
um, um, relationship with Spain, right, with Italy, probably with Germany, on your terms, not within the framework of the European Union, which clearly shows that, I mean, where is the boundary between the European Union and NATO? It kind of overlaps, overlaps yeah. a lot, overlaps. right? And True. so the European Union as a structure is not really uh, benef um, of benefit to the individual European countries, as is pretty evident. Plus, the uh, policies of uh, within the European Union, this is, um, for example, in regards to migration, right? No, oh, yeah. What the European Union Parliament was, uh, they were, why, why did they get so, um, so animated and so pissed at Viktor Orban of Hungary? Prime Minister of Hungary, because Viktor Orban in 2015 or 2016, one. yes, he said, I'm not going to let in yeah. the quota of migrants that you are saying I should let in. I'm right. not going to let them in. So he built a wall. Apparently walls work, as we do understand, right? <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not taking in these people because the people of my country, the Hungarians, don't want this over here. Yeah. At the same time, who was that? Who was the president of France at the time? I don't remember. Was it Macron already? Yeah. Yeah. He opened yeah. he opened the doors to all of these migrants from Africa, from North Africa, right? Sure. And the French people weren't very happy about it. Not at all. It's just a fact. What did the UK do? They let in all of those Same people. Thing. Yes, London nowadays is not very, very English. Not very British. <laughs> That's very true. Yes. Same with Germany. Nobody asked German, the people of Germany, do they want any of these kind of Sweden policies <laughs> Sweden nobody asked these people no there were no referendums by the way no right no no referendums so the people were just told that you're gonna sit there and you're gonna shut up and you're gonna swallow up this and we're gonna let in whomever we want regardless of is there any surging crimes or if you don't like Muslims or whatever we're gonna disregard the, your historic you know heritage and that you're you used to be a mostly Christian nation and we're going to tell you that now under the banner of inclusivity and multiculturalism with which according to the liberals of the west is a strength somehow mm -hmm. you're going to be your population are going to be diluted um by all of these migrants for whatever reason which is going to let them in and they will uh live off the welfare state right and now as of today that was back in 2015 the crisis right Today's 2022, seven years later. What's happening to Europe? Nothing good. Nothing's changed. Nothing's it's changed. Worse. Things yeah. got significantly worse. Right. But the European leaders are not uh, pointing the finger and saying, well, we have internal problems. They're not saying this. They're pointing the finger at Russia over there and they're saying, all the problems are because of, because of that, because of evil Mr. Putin.